All right. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me well? I guess so. Yes. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We are today having another two talks here with the science that we are doing at UAC. And first of all, I have to say that we've been informed that uh, some of the open seminars, webinars at Tufsa University have been hijacked recently during January. So I will have an extra eye to see that nothing weird happens, but in case something weird happens, just so you know what's, what's going on, I'll try to solve it as soon as possible. And um, said that uh, the, the meeting is being recorded. So have in mind that in case you want to open your mic or open your camera and it will be later uploaded to YouTube as well. So today we have two talks about the science at UAC. We have a, a PI that just has joined us, Oscar Berjo, and also a PI that has been with us from the very beginning of the center, Lena Friberg. Um, I will stop sharing this now so we can give the, um, the floor or the screen to Oscar. It's gonna be our first talk today. And as before, we will have Oscar and then we will have a short break and then we continue with Lena's talk. And Oscar, uh, the floor is yours. Also remind you everyone that you can write your questions in the chat. You can also write your questions during the talk and I will let Oscar know. And then we have a little section at the end of the talk for Q&A and you are uh, welcome to either write the questions or open your mic and your camera to give the questions to him directly. And with that, thank you so much, Oscar, for being with us today and all of you that have joined. And thank you, Eva, for the, the introduction. Yes, and uh, I encourage everyone to, if you want to I ask questions during the talk as well, I will do my best to keep track of it in the chat. And uh, hopefully with Eva's help, I will not miss questions for too long. So as was pointed out, my name is Dr. Oscar Vero, and I work as a group leader at the Department of Medicinal Chemistry at Uppsala University. And I, me and my group joined this uh, UAC network uh, very recently. In fact, last year, as was mentioned, as we were very honored to be able to host a UAC a PhD student in our group. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that this presentation will function a little bit as a, uh, since this project is kind of in the startup as kind of an introduction to what we want to do a little bit our, of our group's research. And I will focus specifically on the DNA encoded compound library, which is a technique that we will be using for our project, which I think have great promise to contribute to antibiotic drug discovery. So it's therefore it will not be so much results today, but it will be a little bit introduction about us and our research. So if I start just very briefly to mention uh, my background, I, I'm originally trained as an organic chemist. I obtained my PhD in the uh, area of organic chemistry under the supervision of Professor Beckwell at Stockholm University, where I developed different uh, sorts of catalytic systems. And I really took my first steps within drug discovery and medicinal chemistry during my postdoc, which I did with Professor Schreiber at Broad Institute. And I came back to Sweden in 2017, uh, starting my own academic group, but first at the Department of Organic Chemistry at Stockholm University, but I later moved here to Uppsala University. And the research profile of our uh, group is quite broad and it spans many different topics within the areas of organic organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry. So one can say that our group has one foot in the field of organic synthesis and one in the foot of medicinal chemistry. And really you can split our research into two main branches where the first branch, let me see if I can get a little pointer option available as well, uh, is that the one you see down here. It is the organic chemistry branch, which is focused on developing new synthetic methodologies that can be used, for example, in the synthesis of bioactive compounds or for assembling compounds libraries and then this branch we kind of apply it in our second branch so like the first branch generate a lot of resources like mole uh, bioactive molecules and compound libraries and that is what we bring into the second branch which is more drug discovery oriented uh, focusing currently mostly on antibacterial and antiviral uh, targets uh, so that is the general thing and i think this slide and the next, I will not focus too much on because it's a little bit outside the scope of this research center, but I, I still think it's good to inform you all about the, the research we're doing in our group. Uh, 
uh, because maybe some of you have uh, some, what do you say, small molecule issues or problem that are related to organic chemistry. And I just want to uh, shout out that we're glad to help. So don't be a stranger in case there's something like that on your uh, particular research table. Uh, and uh, we specifically, though, focus on an organic transformation that is called seed functionalization. And it's really about uh, transforming in a selective fashion one of the most common and most stable bonds in organic molecules, the CH bond between carbon and hydrogen. Uh, and this is indeed something that is very challenging, but we, we have in our group been very uh, successful with using a direct, uh, directing group approach. And you can see a directing group kind of like a handle that you install in your molecules uh, to help activate the metal catalyst and direct it to a specific CH bond in your molecules. You can really get high precision in what types of CH bond you want to activate and you can get it to occur in a very high efficiency. And we have been particularly successful when we have been using this directing group shown here, the eight amino quinoline uh, directing group. And we have, for example, used it uh, together with different palladium catalyzed systems to mediate carbon-carbon bond formation in a wide range of drug-like scaffolds, uh, like for example, cyclobutanes, benzofuranes, this myrtonol derived core down here, and also in the different cyclic amino acids. Uh, and with this chemistry, we've been able to access a wide range of chemical structures that are of interest for uh, compound collections or things that you can use to further build more advanced molecules from. Uh, and it really can be seen as a fast track to molecular complexity because by directly functioning, functionalizing CH bond, you, you avoid doing extra chemical transformation, which is bringing CH to another functionality and then continue functionalizing it to the, the group of interest. And we have used this chemistry to install a different functional group like aryl groups, alkenes and alkynes, etc. So this chemistry is very diverse, but let's now get into the actual uh, subject today, which is uh, antibiotic drug discovery. And I, I think I don't have to uh, go that deep into this background because most of you here today are probably much more familiar with this field than I am, but I would at least like to take a few seconds to acknowledge the importance of antibiotics in modern medicine where they offer rapid cure of bacterial infection and they reduce the risk of complications during advanced surgical procedures. Uh, however, this central dogma of modern med medicine is cur currently uh, being challenged by uh, resistant microbial strains. And because of this, it's very important that the, the, we continue to discover and develop new antibiotics to kind of counter this emerging threat. Uh, but what is a bit worrying is the fact and that we have been talking about on previous network meeting is that the discovery rates of novel mechanism of action antibiotics has been rather slow in the past decade. So we really need to do something here fast to kind of turn around this uh, development. And here, I believe that the technique I will be talking about today, the DNA encoded library technology, will play a very important role uh, in contributing to the antibiotic pipeline. That was not a question. Uh, yes, double checking. Uh, uh, exactly. And so, first of all, we maybe should start very basic because maybe not all of you have heard about the DNA encoded library technology. So, what is that, first of all? Well, as the name implies, it can be seen as a compound library where every single library member, so each molecule, has been uh, labeled with a unique DNA bar barcode. So, that can kind of be seen like an identifier sitting on the molecule. And why is that so useful? Yes, it's because if every molecule is have an ID tag on them, you can basically store them in single tube as illustrated by this Eppendorf tube here. So you can have up to a billion chemical compounds in a single container. Uh, and since you can always tell them apart by sequencing the DNA sequence, uh, you can also employ the entire library in a single experiment. So you typically do an something called an affinity-based selection, and then you can um, 
check your, all your compounds against a, a particular target in a single experiment. And by doing so, you can generate massive binding data in a very short time. So it can be very efficient for discovering new chemical matter. It can be used to explore the SAR around the known structure if you build your kind of DEL as being some kind of heat expansion campaign. Uh, and what is nice also, since all compounds fit in a, in a single tube and doesn't have to be stored individually, you don't really need advanced compound management or compound storage facilities that you typically do with other conventional libraries of this size. Uh, so it's quite uh, revolutionary for the drug discovery process. And the interesting part, although the technique has really booming in the last decade, um, the idea is not that new. It was coined by Lerner in 1992, but it has really taken off in a practical sense with, with the development of the sequ sequencing technology. Now that is cheap and very advanced, and that has led to a search in the application of DNA encoded libraries. Uh, and why, in, or as you say, in what part of the the drug discovery process can the Dell workflow uh, improve uh, the drug discovery process. It's actually both in the library synthesis and the screening. That's what makes it so powerful. Uh, for instance, if you look at this, the library synthesis part, uh, the DNA here can be used both as a reaction uh, manifold and an information carrier. And that allows you to be able to do the library synthesis in a split pool format. Uh, and the power of split pool format is that you do a lot of reactions in parallel, so you can save a lot of time. And in principle, how this work in the on DNA is as this kind of complicated figure here I want to show is that imagine that you have uh, a building block, uh, usually it's one multifunction building block. In this figure, I have illustrated as three different ones. Uh, but it could be the same that you have one building block that you, uh, you functionalize in three different ways. Uh, but let's now do a little bit more complicated. Let's say that instead of these three examples per cycle, you have 50. So you put one building block on a common DNA piece, then you split this uh, molecule with the DNA into 50 different wells. Then in each well, you do a unique chemical transformation on this molecule part sitting on the DNA. It's unique in each well. So that means in all wells, you will have a unique compound after the reaction. And then you can encode in each well uh, the, the, this transformation by ligating a new DNA code that is unique for each well. And then in the end, you have 50 compounds uh, seen over all 50 wells. Each one have a unique DNA barcode. Then you can pool all of those 50 compounds, redistribute them into 50 wells. So in each well, you will now have a population of these 50 compounds. And now you do a new reaction sequence in each well. So that means after this second sequence, in each well, you will have a population of 50 compounds that have seen a unique reaction and has been encoded in a unique fashion. So overall 50 wells, you now have 2,500 unique compounds. And if you do it one more time, you get another factor of 50 increase, and then you're suddenly at 125,000 compounds. So, and that can be done in three steps, which is very revolutionary. And you can imagine that this number can be further increased by in applying more building blocks in each cycle or adding more cycles. So commonly now, DNA encoded libraries contain millions to billions of compounds, so they are very rich in different structures. Uh, so from a synthetic perspective, you can now build these libraries that are that big in a matter of weeks, which there is really no other comparative techniques to. Uh, and then also the DNA encoded library technology offered advantages in the screening process as well, because as I mentioned, every compound is uh, have a unique ID, so they are stored together. That means that they can be analyzed or run in experiments together too. And with this type of libraries, you typically do uh, something called an affinity-based selection, where you have your enzyme of interest immobilized on a heterogeneous carrier. And then you incubate this target with your entire library of all the compounds you have and let it sit for a while. Compounds that will bind to your targets will be stuck on it. Uh, and those that do not bind, you can just wash away. 
So in the end, you will have some compounds sitting on your target that is immobilized. So by then later denaturate this target, you will release those compounds that were binders. And now they have unique DNA IDs. So you can basically a sequence this population of binders and you can backtrack to the DNA codes you installed when you made the library. And you suddenly know, hey, these 200 compounds can bind to this enzyme. So in that way, in one experiment, you have found a lot of binders from your large co uh, collection of compounds. And of course, if you have billions of compounds, the amount of binders can be quite much. So there is a little bit uh, data analysis needed after these experiments. And maybe there's a little bit, like you say, heat mapping. You have to find like families of compounds that have in general hit a lot. Those are probably more interesting to follow up than uh, some singletons that might be out. Uh, and one of what one can say one of the limitation of the DNA encoded library technology is of course uh, what type of molecules you can build on the DNA. So I mean, even though this method has a good throughput or very high throughput, uh, one can always argue that if you cannot make that cool structures on the DNA, then the numbers really doesn't matter if the, the quality is bad. But the good thing is that a lot of development has been done in this field. And as you can see in the table down here, most of the commonly used organic transformations can now be done on DNA, enabling very diverse libraries and access to very diverse chemical space. Uh, but as one should remember that, I mean, it has been challenging to develop this chemistry because since the molecules you do the reactions on are sitting on DNA, DNA uh, offers some limitations where, for instance, if one looks at the DNA, it's a very polar uh, and uh, uh, charged uh, molecule uh, with many sensitive functional groups. So that kind of precludes a reaction that needs very strong oxidants or strong acids, because these tend to damage the DNA and make it unreadable for sequencing. Uh, and another thing that is uh, also very important is that since DNA is so polar is that most reactions need to work in mixtures of say 90% water and 10% organic solvent. You cannot go higher in organic solvents because then the DNA is not soluble. So that is also a limitation. But there are, for instance, many water soluble reagents and catalyst system for Suzuki reaction and metal catalyzed reaction that have been developed. So it doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. Another technical challenge is that the reactions you develop must have be, be very high yielding, at least 90% yield, because in this technology, you don't apply any purification of individual molecule along the synthetic sequence. So if you don't have high yielding transformation, you will lose fidelity in your DEL in the end. So let's say that like you, you have a reaction that has 70% yield and gives a lot of uh, byproducts, then it would be very complicated to know in the end which compound actually bound to your target because the same DNA sequence might correspond to a lot of combination of compounds. But uh, fortunately there are many high yielding reactions for this. So it has actually been quite possible to make large libraries with very high fidelity, which is a very positive thing. Uh, and given the high throughput and the power of this technology, it's not surprising that the DELs have started to be used against a lot of different drug targets uh, recently, uh, spanning a wide range of disease targets. Um, but interestingly, the application of the area of de uh, the application of DELs in the area of antibacterial drug discovery have so far remained scarce. Uh, one reason could be that the main user of uh, DEL right now, which is the big pharma companies, are not that active in the antimicrobial uh, and antibiotic area. So that kind of reflects maybe why DEL have not been used that much against it. Another uh, explanation could also be that since you use purified enzymes for your screenings. Uh, maybe researchers within the antibiotic uh, research field have been a bit uh, hesitant about this technology because we all know that uh, target binding is not the only problem to solve if you want to have a, a good antibiotic. There, there's many other hurdles that you need to overcome. But I still think that the Dell technology can contribute here, given its high throughput. It can give you an enormous amount of chemical matter against your target. And then maybe it is okay that 
90% of the target and the compounds you get out, they will fail later due to say poor cell permeability or efflex mechanism, the typical things that kills compounds that are promising antibiotic. Uh, hopefully by having a high number coming out, you will have a useful number of compounds coming out in the under, in the other end. So that is a little bit about the general background of Dell. So now I would just like to share a few slides describing what our planned efforts in this area is and how we plan to use DELS against antibiotic targets. And here I first of all want to uh, say that this project is a collaboration with a group of Anders Kalien and uh, SciLife DDD. Uh, and the, this project kind of started from uh, some discussions I had with Anders Kalien, who is, have been very successful and very active in the area of antibiotic drug development. And he has spent quite much research uh, focusing on the target that you see here, LPXH. Uh, and uh, we did then decided that this would be kind of a suitable target uh, uh, to use as a first proof of concept for our Dell ideas. And I was very grateful and on this as well that we got a proposal accepted so that we could take in a PhD student working on this product. And you see him here is Chris, uh, who will be working in our in our shared labs to develop Dells against LPXH. Uh, and for you who don't know what LPX is for target, it's, it's an enzyme that is involved in the biosynthesis of lipid A, and it plays an essential role uh, for many gram-negative bacteria. And what is interesting about this target is that similar pathway does not exist in humans. It's a quite good target to go after if you want to develop a selective antibiotic. Uh, and starting off against this target, uh, we are planning to make a peptide-based DEL of about 125,000 compounds that Chris will be working on that we hope to prepare during this year and screen against this target. Uh, and we will, as a part of this uh, DEL synthesis campaign, work together with SciLife Lab DDD in constructing this library. And we hope that over time that they will also help us do selection against LPXH with the the publicly available Dell Open Library from Wuxi Aptek, uh, which has an astonishing number of 4.2 billion compounds. So imagine the amount of uh, interesting chemical material you could get out of such a library. Uh, we're also planning to have a look at another antibiotic target, LEP B, uh, which is important both for gram negative and gram positive bacteria. Uh, where it plays a central role in the secretion pathways, uh, catalyzing the cleavage of leader peptide from several pre-peptides. Uh, and like LPXH, this has no homologue in human cells either. So it's a very promising target, I would say. And also here, the group of Kalian has done very impressive pioneering work finding this inhibitor that you see, peptide-based inhibitor you see here which has a non-molar activity against E. coli lep B and also very promising in vivo activity against a wide range of uh, bacterial pathogens. Uh, the downside of this peptide though is that it has an unsatisfactory toxicity profile which limits its further development. So here our plan was to use the Dell technology for comprehensively probe the SAR around this uh, structural motif in the hope of finding analogs that are safer with improved cytotoxicity and hemolytic profiles. And this DEL will then be constructed to uh, have a basic design looking like this inhibitor here, but having many degrees of variability to kind of probe the SAR around this target. And yeah, and that was basically uh, what I had to talk about today since the project is in only the startup. I hope at the next meeting to share some exciting preliminary results from our work. But before finishing, I also would like to highlight all the members of my lab that have been working on uh, this and other projects throughout the years. I'm truly only an ambassador for them. They're their great work that I'm promoting here today. And I also want to have a shout out to the collaborators, uh, particularly those listed here. And I also want to shout out to the funding uh, bodies that have been very generous in supporting our research throughout the years. Uh, and also, I would like to thank you for listening to me today. And I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. 
Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Oscar. That was a great presentation. I, I think I, I really understood what you are going after. And even though there's a lot of chemistry involved. Um, let's see if anybody has any questions. You're getting some applauses and nice reactions to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, does anybody have any questions? I, I have a question um, because this involves working with DNA um, mm. as well, not only just chem chemicals and chemical reactions. Mm. Um, does the people working with this technique needs to have some sort of background in genetics or DNA or something like that? Uh, so if we start from a synthetic perspective, not re I mean, not really. I mean, most of the, the barcodes, they, they are commercially available and the DNA headpiece that you build that your molecules on are commercial with different type of functional group that you can use to link your building block on. Uh, and for the, the encoding steps, when you build in this kind of DNA barcodes, there are uh, commercial kits of uh, different uh, enzymes and the reaction condition you basically you know just mix and mix it and it happens but then of course you needed some knowledge in the sequencing of that and that's uh, here we are collaborating with the, the, the ddd platform which has an extreme knowledge in sequencing technologies and can help us with this kind of hit identification mm -hmm. uh, which you do downstream great um thank you uh, you, you mentioned that there is like a kit available. If I understood correctly, that kit is already the library of all the, a lot of compounds and their modifications to just basically run through targets that you might have in, in mind. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice thing. Like, I mean, it's a very general thing. And that's why we also go for quite general purpose libraries, because basically one target is one experiment. And one could imagine that you could parallelize the, 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 the amounts of target by running the library against different targets. But of course, the, the data work afterwards in like finding the, the, the binders and that and sorting that out, that takes time. So of course, like you can generate the data quite convenient but then of course you have to go through the data as well mm -hmm. we have a question in the chat so philip is asking has there been a report of interaction of dna or linker sequence with the target that one is looking at how can you rule out that only your synthetic entity is the one reacting with the target Mm, yeah, that, that is a serious concern. And it's true that many biological targets are very competent in binding to DNA sequences. And part of this work, like, I mean, you will have some, like get some ideas of the binders you have after these experiments. And then you have to use a little bit brute uh, grunt work as well that you have to synthesize. You, first of all, you identify like families of molecules that you think are promising. Uh, and then you have to synthesize them off DNA, like in a conventional way, and retest them in relevant uh, biophysical or uh, biophysical assays afterwards. So after that, many compounds might be some compound might fall out. It could part be mainly because of that the compound that you thought were sitting on the DNA was not the real one. There was some problem with one particular building block not connecting, so it's a truncated form that bound. Uh, some, as you say, it could have been the DNA sequence binding, so that they will not show up without the DNA. Uh, and then another thing that can happen too is that if you have, say, functional functional biophysical assay, let's say you look at the the an enzyme catalyzing some kind of reaction, and you want to see an inhibition of that one, maybe your compound actually binds to the enzyme, but it doesn't do anything to the catalytic activity. So then that compound is maybe not so interesting as an inhibitor. Might be interesting for, you know, pro application or something like that. Uh, and that is something you cannot really probe with the DNA code library technology because it only looks for binding, but generating data on a lot of binders can still be very useful when the number is big and you, you can select a few and do follow-up experiments. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, does anybody has any maybe last question? If nobody has one, I, I have one, I think. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem so. So you were mentioning that you 
um, the preliminary molecule that Anders worked that binds to Lep B and inhibits Lep B. It has problems with cytotoxicity and I mean toxicity. And what you will do now is using the same approach with the DEL to make analogs that are less toxic, right? Hopefully, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I understand, but my question is like, how do you? test the library for less toxicity is it also a binding essay the same yeah way? you know exactly i mean then you have to do the same sequence it might be a bit laborsome but it can be a, a kind of interesting from understanding the sar that you do you do first the, the type of binding so you kind of figure out like i mean these type of uh, changes are accepted to still have binding against mm -hmm. the target and then you have to you know check these things for those that uh, Th those bound binders with different structures to figure out is there some change in the structure that makes safer compound or is this toxicity a general feature uh, for this type of scaffold then you're kind of in a problem then i mean then that basically is a no-go for the entire structure but we hope to complement this this we say this focus library by using the general purpose libraries that we discover because then maybe those find completely novel structures that are easier to move forward than let's say this structure but i think this one giving the high potency is still interesting to have a little bit further look on maybe it's possible to dial out this toxicity problems mm -hmm. yeah great um if nobody has any more questions anything to say you of course can still write in the chat i believe oscar you're going to be with us over the next talk absolutely well, so. yeah i can try to answer as much as i can right. in the chat. Perfect. So I think with that, what we are going to do is go to the break and we're going to have about 15 minute break. So we'll be back here at a uh, quarter past one to continue and have uh, Lena taking over the screen and the floor. Thank you, everybody, and see you in 15 minutes.